Hey, it's Lauren, and I'm so excited to introduce today's video, which is a conversation that I had with Stephanie Moon over at Steph Moon Co. All about book marketing. We talked about everything relating to author events. We talked about pre-orders. We talked about social media. We talked about expectations for yourself and your publisher if you decide to work with one. So, so, so excited to introduce our conversation. So I don't want to delay this video any longer. Let's go ahead and get right into it. Hi, um, I'm Stephanie Moon, and my background is in traditional publishing. So I worked at traditional publishers for over 12 years doing marketing and publicity, and then now I help authors know how to market their book. Um, and I also do some work with publishers still, but really it's that I found that authors, one, didn't know what to do when it came time to marketing their book, and they didn't know how to do it, right? Because I think those are also two different things, knowing actually the steps you have to take and then taking them, right? And then I think also it helps to know why you're doing this. So um, that's how I help others. I'm so glad that we're able to do this. So thank you so much for... Yeah. you know, being willing and open to kind of try something new. So the first question came from a, from a user, SC Scott Chitano, I'm sorry. Um, and it yeah. says the classic book tour obviously doesn't exist anymore for the vast majority of authors. But in my experience with a big five publisher, there's reluctance to even schedule local events as they seemingly aren't worth the ROI compared to podcasts and other media. That makes sense to me, but, but also seems to abandon a critical part of the publishing ecosystem is is there a solution? So I guess the condensed version of that question mm -hmm. is, you know, is there a solution to the reluctance they face with scheduling these like in-person or physical events? I think, I think talking about events is actually so interesting. Events are so time consuming. Like it's time consuming for the author. It's time consuming for the publisher. You have to get books there. There was like a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And Events are also hard for the bookstore, right? Because they have to hire extra staff, move their stuff, um, get the books. They're like buying extra books. And also sometimes nobody comes. So then everybody or very few people come. So everybody has done a ton more work and they sell two yeah. books. So two books is what? Even at $30 a pop is $60. That's for... Yeah. 10 to 20 hours of work for everybody else, at least. Right. And so I do think like for authors who are like well-connected in their community, know their bookstore really well, that makes sense, right? Have one or two events, but also you have to think about who is going to come to them because a bookstore or retailer only wants to have an event with somebody who they think can drive new people who don't already come to their store in. Yeah. So for the author, it's like a party, a celebration. They get to meet their readers. For the bookstore, they want sales. They want sales of the book they're promoting, any backlist for that author, and then more sales of other books. But it is like a lot of coordination. It doesn't make sense for most people to do that unless they know they can support each event with attendees mm. so I think it's more this is where that question of like platform comes into play right yeah it's like if you have a big platform and you have people located all over the country that want to come to an event of yours sure have them all over you can sell a ton of books but if your platform is small what's the draw for the bookstore and what's the draw for the consumer to come to this event. I think, oh my gosh, I had so many thoughts when you were talking too, just like so many other supplemental questions that came up, which is really good. But I think that tends to be the surprise for authors is that they think that the publisher is going to coordinate and do everything for them without the author expecting to bring in or to draw on some of the crowd themselves. And I think that's totally where platform comes in. And that's already a huge question mark for a lot of people with not only like, how do I do that? But also how necessary is it? Because I don't like social media, which I think might have gone along with another question that came up too, which was from KK Phillips. She said, is it possible to market a book without social media? So I guess that's a really good lead in to that type of thing yeah. about like, how and do you? Yeah, I think, yes, that's possible. But like, what are you doing instead? So like marketing without social media doesn't mean I get to write in a cabin in the woods by myself. It's like, do you have a newsletter? Do you go to events? Are you part of a, um, a part of an in-person community, your church, an organization, 
Girl Scout, what's, whatever, parenting, PTA, whatever, whatever your in-person organization is, like, are you involved in that? Are you involved in professional organizations? Are you involved in whatever it is? Because you can do it, but you have to still be out there, right? Like, yeah. If you are on social media, you have like a higher threshold for visibility, a higher, not threshold, you have a higher a chance to be visible. Right, right. Does yeah. Do those like types of efforts with not only like self-promotion and building up your platform and social media and stuff, do you feel like those efforts vary for nonfiction versus fiction? Or do you feel like there's more overlap than there are like um, separate efforts for drawing in crowds or for platform building? That might be kind of a multifaceted yeah. question, yeah. I think that for nonfiction, you have to have a platform if you want to go the traditional route. If you're writing like a yeah. business book, a self-help book, a cookbook, right? Because it's like what differentiates your book from somebody else's is like your story, the way you present it, what you put in the head notes, right? Like all of that, your personality coming through is what makes it really different. It definitely feels like the market for fiction is like more democratized, right? Like as I was mm -hmm. working with some romance writers, like recently self-publishing a romance book and like putting it on Kindle Unlimited or Kindle Bella is fine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people can do that. Right. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of money to be made there for sure. Yeah. Um, I think the most, probably the most successful even romance writers, right, still have a platform. Mm -hmm. They spend time building and connecting with their community, right? So they get ideas from them. They're like, oh, you know, readers say, I really loved this character, right? And then they write a spinoff of that, you know? It's really like listening and then taking that feedback for to help you like move move forward. Yeah, I mean, so, so like with all of that in mind, how necessary do you think it is for an author, fiction or nonfiction, to build like a strong relationship with their community? Like, is that just libraries? Is that just bookstores? Is it kind of like a mix of different places? Is it like coffee shops? Does it maybe, you know, is it easier to build those types of relationships in a city versus like maybe a suburb or something? I know I just threw like 10,000 questions at you, <laughs> but oh. may maybe it depends on their, on their goals maybe. Like if they're wanting to go for the gold, I would imagine that having that is a pretty strong factor. It depends on what you want, right? Depends yeah. on your book. But also know, knowing knowing really clearly who your audience is versus like not really sure is kind of what kind of like yeah. the difference yeah. in really successful marketing, right? That really just targets that customer versus something that's like, you know, really, you're really like working on really trying things out, which is fine, but just it's, it's a different, um, it's like a different campaign if you're not sure who your audience is. The community really kind of is where the, where the heart is. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's so much easier to start small and build out than to have these big dreams and expectations, which is great. And then being sort of disillusioned by it when it doesn't work out the way that you want, or you find out too late or, you know, later than you thought that, oh, okay, some of this is on me too. It's not all just, you know, the magic touch of the publisher or something. It's like so much on the author, right? Yeah. And so- so to explain it in this way, imagine that you got a, a deal with like PRH, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Amazing. Congratulations. Right. And even though they have different imprints, you have to also think about, sure, this imprint, right, has a big social following, maybe bigger than yours. They have an email list, probably bigger than yours. But each imprint also publishes a variety of things. They can publish fiction, nonfiction, self-help, um, cookbooks, decor, gardening, parenting, children's, right? They're so, um, the genre range is so wide for many of these imprints that you don't right. know if that person who signed up for that newsletter um, really prefers, likes parenting and self-help books. While your book is um, a business productivity guide, right? Who's on the list and what they're interested in. Whereas your list, if you're the productivity guide, you know, everybody wants to like, learn about how to be more productive, how to save more time, what tips can they implement right away. That's why your publisher wants you to be able to sell to your own audience. I see like on threads, on Instagram, on Reddit, wherever that people are like, oh, but I got a deal with the big five. Aren't they just going to like do your marketing? And I'm like, well, you can't expect your publisher to do everything. They're right. more like a partner and they can amplify what you're doing. Mm. but they also need you to be doing that's a good way to think about it yeah it's like they can amplify what you've already set up for yourself you know 
because they have so much prestige and they have such a wide reach in a platform. I think that's a really good way to think about it. Yeah, it's just your publisher does a lot of stuff. <laughs> I think, yeah, well, and I guess another question that comes to mind too that's, that blends really well with all these different points is the whole question about the almighty pre-order, right? Like how necessary are pre-orders? That's a question I hear so much and that I see so much about like, how necessary are they? Is it gonna make or break me? Um, I always say that it kind of varies. If you're with a bigger press, I'd say that those generally have more importance. But if it's just you and you're wanting to go for Amazon bestseller or something, I don't really think it's necessary unless you're going for a broader category, maybe. But I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts, too. If you're with a bigger publisher, pre-orders matter because that's what a lot of accounts place their order against. Accounts can see how many pre-orders there are, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll just do, they'll have their own formula of like, how they place an order. So let's say you have 150 pre-orders. They, Amazon and Barnes & Noble and whatever, they have their own little formula that they use to figure out, okay, there's 150 pre-orders. We're going to order this, mm -hmm. right? And some, some publishers also use the pre-order as like a gauge for like how powerful or engaged in authors like audiences um mm. retailers will see it other retailers like um that also might carry the book might see like oh this person has a lot of pre-orders on our site what can we do to support them right because mm -hmm. retailers all want to of course one make money and two support the things that consumers are interested in right and somebody is really interested in a book if they're willing to pre-order because it's basically mm -hmm. like so delayed gratification you're basically buying something that yeah. you're not going to get for two weeks two months to like six months away right it shows interest right and yeah. it's important for bestseller lists um but it's also like kind of shows people on the publishing side like almost like what's the trajectory kind yeah. of of this it's kind of like one indicator that yeah. people are yeah. using to see like okay do we do do we increase the print run do we do another print run sure. do we push this with other accounts because we can see this has 500 pre-orders yeah um, so it sounds like it's more of an indicator in a lot of different ways for the publisher and maybe some bookstores and physical retailers and less so of an ego stroke for the author the author yes. might be like oh i have 300 pre-orders I must be doing really well for myself. And it seems like the purpose of a pre-order is more for, okay, what print run can my publisher expect? What does this say about the engagement and the relationship that I have with my audience? How mm -hmm. does this influence any orders that maybe bookstores or libraries might be putting yeah. in for carrying this kind of book? And it's less so just for superficial, like flashy reasons. Yes. Because also, right, it's like, I think indicator is like the right word because it can so. tell some stuff, but it's not the end all be all, right? Yeah. And for somebody who is self-publishing, I also think pre-orders are helpful because at least it helps you ramp up your promotion. So you're like promoting in a way that feels like it's leading to something, right? Yeah. Versus yeah. I've like talked to authors who are like, going to be done on Thursday I'm going to put it on sale um on Saturday and I'm like uh, okay I was like but you don't even have a cover yet what are who have you talked to what are mm -hmm. you do doing anything for the launch of your book and they're like no and I was like okay that's that's fine if you want but also how are people going to find your book mm-hmm I think it's like there's sort of an assumption that the algorithm will just kind of naturally carry it and like boost it and it's like there's so many books. It is so easy to publish a book nowadays. You can literally write a book and publish it three days later. What, you know, what's to say that, you know, 500,000 other people aren't doing it that same day. It's like putting a book on Amazon is not like a marketing or like sales tactic. That's just like, like the bare minimum, right? Yeah. To do, because otherwise, how are people going to get your book? Right. right. So I guess another question too that's a little bit lesser known that maybe some authors, especially new ones, don't really think about is once your book is out there and it's in the world and people can actually buy it now, what now? Like, what are you supposed to do? It's out there. Is Are you supposed to keep marketing the book? If you are, for how long? Like, what do you, once it's out there, is that the end? And I think that's kind of where misconception is that it's like the end of the rainbow, but it's sort of like a pregnancy and then a birth. It's like, no, you have a whole life after the book is out there in the world. 
Exactly. Yeah. Because the day of your like your on sale date, right? At a publisher right. is like the first day that somebody who follows you or who sees you or whatever discovers you can go to a bookstore, go to Amazon, go to wherever and buy the book and get it immediately. It's yeah. basically like the birthday. That's when you have to also continue promotion because people are finally able to get it, right? Like it's just yeah. the start at the on sale date. And mm -hmm. I think also authors often are ti so tired by the time their on sale date comes, if they're doing a lot of pre-order stuff, which I totally get. I know it's so much work. It's so hard. There's like a lot of new stuff that you're doing, but also mm -hmm. after your book comes out, it can live for as long as the book is selling, right? Yeah. So I would continue to promote it, right? Continue to be out there, continue to do media, continue to, mm -hmm. you know, do speaking events because then people can literally get the book the day they see you. They can go yeah. to a bookstore. They can go to the back of the room where mm -hmm. a bookseller is selling books, right? A week or depending on the publisher and the book, right? Like maybe a month right. after your book comes out. Many times you're like, more frequent communication with your publisher's marketing and publicity team has died down. And it's not because they, they hate you now or something, right? They're like, how come they're like not emailing me? I'm like, because I think what authors also need to realize is that the publisher in every department, right, is working on three to five seasons at a time. So right. there's like kind of like, oh, there's just like new, new books. There's more stuff to do, right? It's more like there's other stuff to do. Not that your book is now no longer um, like good. It's just that, oh, a new season is coming. Yeah. That I have to work on. Yeah. Are there any marketing tactics that you've tried or that you've seen that you feel like are fairly consistent? Or do you feel like it really just kind of varies depending on the author and the subject matter? Good question. I think a lot depends. The media landscape is different, right? So I would say like five maybe not five, maybe like seven to 12 years ago, right? Being on Good Morning America, Today Show, Trish. being in the New York Times, right? Mm -hmm. Would drive a lot of books. But because media um, and people's attentions are so fragmented, yeah. um, there are not that many media outlets that move books in the same way. Right. It used to be, oh, being in Oprah's favorite things list, right? right. You could, that would be like, a ton of product, right? And I've worked on like books that have been part of it. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a lot. Like I, I would like have to rush to our production and be like, do we have this? We need to save this. This is like, this information is embargoed, but save this, all this stock for me. Yes, the president knows. Yes, this, you know? And so, yes, that's a big deal. But then I think now her list is still good, but doesn't have that same effect. Mm -hmm. Um, because there are so many different places people get news. I think influencers also really like have mm -hmm. kind of changed the like consumer shopping landscape yeah. and cycle, mm -hmm. right? Stuff like TikTok shop, I think even. It's really, really different. So I think it's like knowing your audience, right? And yeah. um, yeah. and I would say like the most successful authors are the ones that have like really dedicated platforms who so have spent like years building that platform right so I'm for instance like right now um, in the cookbook space thinking about this woman named Caroline Chambers she just came out with her book it came out like I think maybe three to four weeks ago and she has Where's my phone? Let me see. She has like a very dedicated following on Instagram right a little bit shy of 250,000 people so yeah. it's not like it's not like a ton though. I mean, it's a lot, but right. there's definitely people who get book deals who have like million, two million, three million, five million, right? So yeah. she has like a decent sized following, but they are literally so engaged. And she did like the kind of book tour that like, I'm sure all people imagine when you think of book tour, right? She went to tons of places. She was on Good Morning America. She was like on the East Coast and then did stuff on the West Coast. And I think she might be, doing some more I'm not sure and she got on the New York Times bestseller list right but it's also because she spent prior to her book coming out she spent like probably like 10 plus years building her community you know she has like a very popular sub stack that she works really hard on right it's not just her writing one paragraph right she works really hard on knowing her audience who they are and what they want and giving that thing to them, right? So they feel yeah. very loyal to her. 
I, I feel like the th magic trick, I guess, that works is the one that's the really boring answer for people, which is like, you know, the consistency. It's about, you know, going really deep on a platform. It's about, you know, considering what they want, not what you want. I feel like that is the least sexiest answer out there, but I feel yeah. like that's what I've seen a lot and what I'm sure you've seen a lot with people who yeah. have such large engaged followings who would follow someone like that around on a book tour or, you know, would buy, yeah. you know, a bunch of pre-orders. And it's, it takes so long. There's sort of like this instant gratification thing that can happen when an author says, oh, okay, or, you know, a writer says, I want to be an author. And, you know, they write a book, they put in the work. And it's, it's such a short amount of time when it takes so long to prime it up to that point of publication where people want to see it and they want to buy it and they want to support you because they already like, know, and trust you, I feel like. Yes. So what I can say to like an author is basically like, I get it. Like writing a book is so hard. Like I could never write a book. Like, I don't know how to start that. I don't know what to do yeah. for that, right? But the other half of publishing is the marketing, is the promoting, right? right? And it takes just as long or longer to do the marketing because marketing includes like finding your audience, knowing exactly who they are, how to talk to them. What do they want? What are their likes? What are they hoping to get from your book? Why should they read your book? Like all of these questions, right? It's such a consistent thing that has to happen over such a long period of time. It's no, in some ways it's really no different than writing a book. Like if you really want it, you're going to be willing to work at it to see it through until the end. You know, in the case yes. of a book, it's the actual product, but with marketing, I don't know, that's more of a personal sort of answer I suppose but it's also like I try to explain too for authors you know like a, a lot of times um, I'll see, talk to authors and they're like oh I really like don't want to start talking about my book till I have a website or like oh my um, website isn't good I like don't want to say anything and I'm like dude people complaining that your website can't be reached is like the best problem to have right like people are not see like doing all that extra work yeah um, unless they know like and trust you so it's right. like building right. that building that group of people that even wants to see your website you could build a website in a weekend if mm -hmm. you want mm -hmm. an easy a simple one. it's not like the best one but it will do but you cannot build an audience in that short of time that's like a definitely like a mindset shift right for authors they're like uh, I don't yeah. want to talk about my book. I'm like, yeah, but talking about your book is not saying, here's my book, buy it. Not all the time. Yeah. Sometimes it is. But sometimes it's telling them like, what's your inspiration? What's the story behind this? And they're like, oh, mm -hmm. does anybody care? And I'm like, yes, of course people care because that's what makes you different. Right. So is that yeah. kind of kind of your approach when it comes to people or working with people or folks who have a hard time self-promoting? Is it because what I always say is like, you know, what, why would I go tell other people about it when you're not willing to speak on it yourself? Like if you're not excited about it, why should I get excited about it? That shift for an author is like one of the most <clears throat> difficult things, right? Because they're yeah. like, I don't want to be too salesy. I don't want to talk about my book. If they wanted to buy my book, they could just do the work, right? And <clears throat> they could like Google me or whatever. And I'm like, okay, yes, of yes. But the people who are willing to do that are like, fewer and further between than if you told them mm -hmm. if you linked to your book if you linked to your email sign up page where they can like get to know you more right and I think also the idea of like people need to get to know you as a person yeah. you're not just an author of a self-help book you are also a partner you're also a daughter you're also an artist you're also a swimmer you're also whatever all of these things right because mm -hmm that part about um, getting to know you, right, is right. so important. There has to be like other things that like kind of resonate mm -hmm. with your audience and you. I also always have or frequently have this conversation where people are like, I'm so introverted. I'm so private. Mm -hmm. I'm so whatever you want to insert there. And I'm like, that's fine. I'm, I, I'm not I'm not telling you to ch share your license plate or the outside <laughs> of your house or yeah. if you don't want, don't share pictures of your partner or your kids or whatever. Sure. But there has to be something about your life um, that you feel like sharing that you yeah. want to like connect with because if you're just like robotically talking about your book mm -hmm. there's no connection point right mm -hmm. because I think and I think also that idea of like creating like parasocial relationships with people online is also what like 
brings them close to you, right? Or yeah. makes them feel like, I want to see what this person wrote. Mm-hmm. Right. And you can't do that really if you don't share anything. And so like, I always advise like, okay, so think about like two or three things besides um, like your book that you want to talk about. Maybe it is your writing process. Mm-hmm. Maybe um, it is your pet. Maybe it is your obsession right. with Game of Thrones, wh- whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Have something that you can share so you are also not just like a flat author. You have dimension, you have like interest in like other stuff, right? There's other stuff about you that's, that people can connect with. All of the wisdom and insight that you're sharing, I feel like, like, I feel like it could, it could only benefit so many different people. So I, really appreciate you taking the time to kind of yeah. talk with me about marketing and like nerd out a little bit about it together. Is yes. there one piece of advice that you would give any type of new author who's in the middle of writing a book, who wants to be an author? If there's one or two pieces of wisdom you could share, what is it that you'd want to pass on? Just start, right? Because it's never going to be like the perfect time um, and you're never going to feel ready, right? But if you start now, you'll have had so much experience. And so kind of thinking in that way, right? Very, very cliche, very like, I'm sure you've heard it. And, you know, you can only get better, but the line is not linear, right? It's like up, down, up, down, up, down, right? But if you start when you think you're ready, right? You've lost, you've almost like lost all of this time because you're still going to have to learn the same lessons, right? Whether you start now or a year from now, six months from now, right? So I think that, And I think also like really build your community because also publishing is so, can be so lonely, right? Like if you're in the writing process, you know, taking time to like refine your idea, find beta readers, whatever, like that can feel really lonely, I think. And then also that community is also what's going to kind of cheer you on and like pull you through, right? Like that promotional Mm -hmm. period. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I loved like every time I talk with you, which has only been a couple times, but when I've talked with you, I've loved the conversations that we've had. I just, I I love being able to nerd out with you about this kind of stuff. It's always a really great time. (laughs) Yeah. I love it too. Thanks Lauren. (laughs) Thanks for watching today's video. I really hope you got something out of it and you found it super valuable. Definitely be sure to check out Stephanie over on Instagram, as well as her website once it's up and ready for your eyes. In the meantime, definitely be sure to check out the resource that she left down below for you in the description box. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, Feel free to like and subscribe in the meantime, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care. See you then. Bye.